Philippines, there is a group of uh, Baptists that are so o opposed to celebrating Christmas that they do not want to do uh, to have to do to anything that is associated with Christmas. So they said that uh, the Christmas tree is something that is of a uh, paganistic origin that it is used in a uh, idolatrous worship and that gift giving is practiced during uh, in the future it will be practiced when the two witnesses died uh, during the time of great tribulation and uh, as, as, they, as the world celebrate the death of the two witnesses they exchange gifts or they gave gifts to each other and they uh, apply that to the uh, gift giving or exchanging of gift during Christmas. So there are so many things that uh, they associated with Christmas. And those were the reasons why they do not celebrate Christmas. But if you will observe, those who oppose Christmas will readily accept a Christmas bonus. And they will also take advantage of Christmas vacation. And they will buy items that were discounted because of Christmas sale and all of these things. So we can sometimes see a double standard in this uh, camp or group of people or Christians who do not believe in celebrating Christmas. Actually, even the Jehovah's Witness they do not believe in celebrating Christmas in as much as they do not believe that we should even celebrate our birthdays. Because for them, that is a simply idolatry. So, we're going to look today at some reasons why uh, some Christians or even many Christians do not celebrate what we call this season or Christmas. They have an argument or arguments against the celebration of Christmas. One is that they say, and it is true, actually, some of the arguments are true, but I do not agree with the uh, conclusion after they presented their argument. So one argument against celebrations of Christmas is that Christmas is commercialized and became so materialistic. And that is true. If we're going to, to look at uh, Christmas season or this season, we can see that there is so much commercialization going on regarding this uh, celebration or event. And people are focused mainly on the material things of this season and not really on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and that because the Lord Jesus Christ was born, it made it possible for him to live a sinless life, to die on the cross, to be buried, to be resurrected for our justification. So this has been lost in the celebration of Christmas. And because of that, they said that we should not even celebrate Christmas because it is commercialized and it is very materialistic so that is uh, their objection in the celebration of christmas and that uh people are focused on gifts receiving gifts and there's so many things that are associated with christmas actually when i was in college i uh, i made a, a questionnaire and, and a study regarding christmas i was then uh, an unbeliever but I asked uh, 100 people, like, like uh, 100 people surveyed, and the top, top six answers are on the board, something like that. And I asked, what is the first thing that, will, that uh, comes into your mind when you hear the word Christmas? And in the Philippines, of course, we, we have a peculiar way of celebrating Christmas. So they say that, some uh, say that Simbang Gabi, that is the uh, uh, nightly masses until uh, the day of Christmas or New Year. And then Bibinka and Putubongbong. Of course, that is very popular in the Philippines. It is as if there is no Christmas if there is no Bibinka and Putubongbong. And then, of course, in Pampanga, because I live in Pampanga, uh, they said the uh, parole 
festival or the lantern, lantern festival, which is the biggest in the world. Uh, we celebrate that in, in my province in the Philippines, where lanterns are as big as uh, uh, the height, two to three, uh, I think two-story building, something like that. They're huge. They're big, and they, they spend uh, almost some half a million pesos in order to build these gigantic lanterns. And then only one answered, Jesus Christ. And it so happens that she was a Nazarene or a member of the church of Nazarene. I was not able to maybe uh, interview or ask a Baptist during that time, which I'm not familiar with, with, with the Baptist. But she was a Nazarene and only one answered uh, Jesus Christ. Some answered Santa Claus and uh, so many other things that are associated with Christmas. So that is the reason why many Christians do not want to celebrate Christmas or they object in the celebration of the Christmas. So if we're going to use this argument as a legitimate reason for discarding the entire celebration of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it would naturally follow that we would end up throwing everything, even our Bibles, even our husbands, even our wives, almost everything that we have in this world. Why? Because the world has distorted so many things. Like, for example, uh, they have distorted the family. They, they made uh, uh, so many things about the family. The family is a husband and a wife and children. And now they can be both men. They can be both women. And even though uh, uh, children in the family are not legitimate children, they still consider that they're that a family. So they distorted it. So is it because the word distorted the family, then we're going to do away with the family? Of course not. We're going to keep what is biblical. We're going to keep what is right and continue to celebrate what we ought to celebrate. So we do not, should not allow the word to inhibit us or prohibit us in doing something because they have distorted these things. Because if we are going to apply this across the board, then it is going to really hurt us. But they say that uh, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.22. Can, can we go there, please? Paul says, abstain from all appearance of evil. So they said that in the celebration of Christmas or the things that are associated with Christmas, there are things that appear to be evil. So, uh, this is a Bible verse, and we should do this, we should obey this. But then again, we should not be what we call so uh, literalists or hyper-literalists in the point that we are going to abstain ourselves from all appearance of evil in a way that we adapt how the word do this and how the world look at this. Because as Christians, we have a different set of mind. We have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ is not evil. It is not a mind that always think about evil. It is a mind that is uh, godly. It is a mind that look at things in faith or with faith. Let us look at for, uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 5. Parang nagkabali ako. Fifteen, I'm sorry. Unto all, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. So, they say that Christmas tree is an appearance of evil. So let us, uh, let us avoid these things. Because we should uh, not allow ourselves and must abstain from, abstain from all appearance of evil. So because Christmas tree has an appearance of evil, then we should abstain from it. But Titus chapter 1.15 says, to the pure, all things are pure. So we're not going to look at it in an evil way. But then again, the, the question really is this. 
is a Christmas tree, the one mentioned in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 44, 14 to 15, Jeremiah 3, and Jeremiah, I believe, chapter 10. But it, it is another study, but we're going to look uh, closer to those verses. It is simply prohibiting what we call idolatry. That people are going to the, 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 the forest or the woods, and they will cut a tree, and they will fashion it, and they're going to worship it. We're not worshiping the Christmas tree. I don't know who among you worships the Christmas tree. I do not. It is just an ornament. It is just something that, that, uh, help, that may help us celebrate uh, this uh, season with more, uh, more festive than when we do not have those things. But if for a Christian, it is something that he or she believes that is not a should not be done, then let's do away with the Christmas tree. You, you, you do away with the things that you think may not be biblical or appropriate in celebrating uh, this particular event. Because you have to be persuaded in your own mind. But it is not our position to judge those who want to celebrate if we are not celebrating. Or to judge those who are not celebrating Christmas if we are celebrating Christmas. So they say it is commercialized, materialistic. Well, if you are celebrating it that way, then you should abstain from it. But if you know how to celebrate the season, not because of the material things or the commerce that is involved with it, but you are celebrating it in the spirit that God gave His only begotten Son to us, so that we can be saved, then I don't see anything wrong with that. So that is a, one uh, objection that they argue against the celebration of Christmas. Number two is that they said that the scripture does not authorize the celebration of Christmas. They will argue that the Bible is not clear and the Bible actually did not authorize the Christian to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ during such a season. Actually, if you're going back to history, uh, it is not until 335 or 336 AD that the first celebration of the, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ was actually done in a church setting. And the word Christmas did not appear until 1028 AD. And that is, of course, because of uh, Catholicism. So that is why they said that you will not find anything in the Bible from the early church that celebrates the uh, birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. They celebrate the resurrection by meeting every first day of the week. They celebrate the uh, death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but there is nothing in the Bible that shows us that the first church or the early church celebrated the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they say that we should not celebrate it because it is not authorized by the Word of God. Again, I will go to what we call hyperliteralism in using the Word of God. If we are going to use such approach, then most of the time, we are going to miss the uh, spirit of the Word of God. We will only look at what is the word for word that is written in the Word of God that many cults are using during our time. Like, for example, they will say, uh, can you read in the scripture that salvation is by faith alone? Can you read that literally? Of course, there is no such phrase in the Bible. There is a phrase in the Bible that salvation is by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But they said that it did not say that faith alone, or faith only, or faith plus nothing, minus nothing. So that is hyperliteralism. They said that because we cannot find it in the Bible, then... It should not be practiced by the church. Actually, when I was 
in the Philippines and debating with a certain person, he said that because you cannot read it in the Bible, it is not true. And I said, what is your name? He said, my name is Rohelio. I said, can we read your name in the Bible? He said, no. So therefore, you are not true. And he got angry with me. Because that's the argument that they give. So because there we cannot find anything in the Bible that the church celebrated the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, as a Christian church, we should not also celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, if we will apply this, then we should not even have this. Because it's not authorized by the Bible. We should not use hymnals because it is not authorized by the Bible. We should not even be in a building like this because it is not authorized by the Bible. No Sunday school because it's not authorized by the Bible. So the point is not the uh, exact letter only, but the spirit, the intention of the Word of God. The Bible is very clear that we should study the Word of God, hence the Sunday school. It said because it said that you must do Sunday school, it is not because we should not do it because the Bible says you, there, 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 there is no uh, precedent for a Sunday school, but we have Sunday school because we want to learn and study the Word of God. Even Bible study, we do that. Even uh, uh, soul winning and visitation, we do that. Of course, they are in the Bible, but there are so many programs in the church that are not written in the Bible, but we do them anyway because they aid us, help us in obeying God and in growing in the faith. So when we use this argument that because the Bible does not authorize it, then we are going to be in trouble because the same argument can be used. I cannot even use this. It's not in the Bible. No sound system. Because it's not in the Bible. But why are we using it? Because it amplifies the voice and helps us uh, hear the uh, preacher. And in a large crowd, it will help us. If we use this... Uh, um, uh, things that will amplify the voice of the person that is speaking or teaching the word of God. So there are so many things that we cannot do in the church anymore if we are going to use this kind of ag argument. So we need to understand that the argument of silence is not an absolute argument. Because the Bible is silent, then we should not do it. No. We must always uh, read the Word of God and using our common sense. Oh. And God has given us that common sense in order for us to understand also clearly what the Bible is teaching. Actually, if you will study hermeneutics, there is one... Uh, what we call law of interpretation, and that is common sense. If the Bible has given a clear sense, then look for no other sense. So that is something that we need to uh, consider. So not because it is not written in the Bible expressly, or because it is not commanded, therefore we should not practice it. So that is their argument, and we do not believe on that argument. Of course, on certain clear things, but there are things that uh, the Bible may not be explicit. But we can see that it is implicitly implying that there is nothing wrong if we are going to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, the, the passage that we have heard cause for a great celebration in the heart of the shepherds when they heard about the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is actually a Bible precedent. We're going to look at that uh, later. Number three argument against the uh, celebration of Christmas is because the scripture forbids it. So they said that, well, not only that the Bible did not authorize it, the Bible actually forbids the celebration 
of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the text that they use is Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So they said here that it forbids the celebration of religious seasons or holidays when they have been prescribed as religious duty and necessary for holiness or is spirituality that is the uh, essence of Ephesians 2 16 and 17 but according to those who forbid the celebration of Christmas is that uh, they claim that the scripture actually warns and forbids the observance of any special months season days or religious festivals what the scripture is forbidding is the celebration of those things that are just a mere shadow or type of the Lord Jesus Christ but when the Lord Jesus Christ now when the Lord Jesus Christ came then we should not be celebrating those things because the substance is already here so that is what the Bible is actually forbidding in this passage the Apostle is talking about the Old Testament festivals that's why we we do not celebrate the Old Testament festivals we do not have the first fruits offering, but others have. And that is the main event of their church, especially this December, because they will collect one month's salary of their members, and they call that the first fruits offering. Actually, one question that I ask uh, a proponent of this is that, why do you have to take it in December? Why not January? Because January is the beginning of the years, and that's the first month. So I believe that is uh, logically uh, the month that you should take your first fruits. Of course, in the Bible, it's a different thing. But they said, but they say that uh, it is practical to get the first fruits in December. Why? Because people receive Christmas bonus or 13th month pay so that they can easily give it because they still have a budget for the whole month of December. So I said, wow, that is a clear logical reason for getting the first fruits in the month of December because uh, even if you will give it all away then you, you still have the uh, salary for December to use for the whole month but if you will do it in January then as you, when you gave your one month away then there is nothing to use in the month of January so this was an a, 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 a what you call a discussion that went on for a while in churches that celebrate or that practice first fruits offering so they made a way in order to make it easier for people to give their first fruits so they said we're going to do it this way you are going to give your first fruit in, in an installment way you divide your, your one month salary into 12 because one year is a composed of 12 months and you're going to give it installment 12 times and it will culminate in December to finish your first puts. well of course that is just money making scheme but we do not celebrate those festivals in uh, how in how they did it in the Old Testament why because the substance is already here Christ is our first fruits. amen we don't celebrate the uh, so many festivals that are in the Old Testament because they are not necessary for our salvation and our spirituality. They uh, were pointing to the coming of the Lord, to the work of the Lord. And when the Lord came and he actually died on that cross, actually was buried and rose again, it fulfilled all of those festivals actually the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, burial and resurrection fulfilled all the laws in the Old Testament. And that's why the Bible says Christ is the end of the law. To them that believe, to them that are justified because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is what this uh, passage is actually forbidding. That we should not 
celebrate these things as necessary to our salvation that when you celebrate them then you have you will have uh, more points towards going to heaven or that you will become more spiritual than other people who are not celebrating these things the issue is this it is not the observance but the reason the attitude and the spirit in which we observe christmas in which we observe or celebrate the birth of the lord jesus christ especially when it is done with love devotion and worship you see in a practical way i like for example those that are teaching here in cambodia as teachers you are not allowed to teach about uh, the lord jesus in your classes uh, actually brother uh, matthew experienced this before he was warned or even removed because he taught about christ uh, during one of uh, the english class it's not allowed but during this time it's, if, if the classes are going on this is the only time that the school will allow you to teach about the lord jesus christ because of the christmas season so we can uh, use that as an advantage in order to make the people know about the the uh, salvation that the lord jesus christ is offering by using his birth as a springboard in witnessing to these people who otherwise will not even listen to the gospel if not for this season more people are quite open to the gospel during this season i remember my grandmother my grandmother is so opposed when i became a christian because she was a devout catholic actually uh, in the catholic church in our place in the philippines the first uh, i think five pews bore the, the names the family names of our uh, clan because they're literally the ones who built that church and almost everything that's in the church is because of the family so that is their devotion we have priests and nuns in the family so when when i got saved and became a christian they were so opposed they actually disowned me because of that and i became almost invisible in our house they do not want to have uh, to do anything with me because they hated me for becoming a baptist and then i i, I endured that uh may i got saved may 14 until december 15 of 1986 and then december 15 that evening because my grand we have a store a, a restaurant a small restaurant and my grandmother is always cooking bibinka during the uh, uh what we call midnight masses in the catholic church because our house is just across the catholic church our our store or canteen so that night after uh, preparing this galapong for uh for bibinka since may since i got saved may 14 it was the first time that my grandmother called me he said apo will you please come here and i was surprised i said to myself i'm not invisible anymore my grandmother now can see me and then when i approached her i said uh, what's the matter apo that's how i call her and then she asked me why is there a christmas and then i took that opportunity i opened the bible started in john 3 16 and explained to her the way of salvation and then after that i i i i asked her if, if uh, she understood what i have said and 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 then and, and i repeat it again i think i i did it three times because i wanted to uh be very very clear to her because my prayer since i got saved is this you see i was yet one year old when my parents separated and i was given to the care of my grandmother that's why i love my grandmother so much my prayer when i was still an unbeliever is that if my grandmother will die i ask god that i will die before her because i really could not imagine how to live in this world without my grandmother that's how close we are and i'm the first of all the grandchildren just imagine that in the philippines how close could we really be we're very very close to each other actually my grandmother uh loves me more than her own children that is how close we are and then after that i asked her because that is my my prayer to god is that 
when I got saved, Lord, please give me one chance. Just one chance that I may be able to give a clear presentation of the gospel to my grandmother or use my pastor or other, other Christian in order to explain to her the way of salvation. But God granted my, my prayer that night. So after that, I said, Apo, if you really understand this, I hope before you go to sleep tonight, you will repent of your sin and you will receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. And I said, you can even do it now if you believe in your heart. You will be saved. And you can pray and thank God for saving you. And she prayed that night. It is not the prayer that saved her. There, there is no faith plus prayer that will save a person. But prayer is a manifestation of what you are thankful to God for what He had done in your life. So she prayed that night thanking God for the opportunity that we had. And then she went to her bed. And then that was her last night on earth. She died that night. But one thing is true. God answered my prayer. And maybe if not, for that season, if not that December may help or may make some people think more of Jesus than other months of the year. And then God used that opportunity, that season, so that I could present to her the gospel of her salvation. God knowing and appointed that it was her last night here on earth. And I was so thankful because of that. And I am going to keep using that, this event or this season in order to preach the word of God to people who in other months may not even think about opening their heart and listening to the word of God. So that is uh, how I look at it. That is why I celebrate it because it can be used by God and by the Holy Spirit when people's hearts are a little bit more tender than compared to other months without uh, this uh, what we call the season of celebrating the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you know that more people are kinder uh, during uh, this uh, season? More people are forgiving during this season. Well, you say, Pastor, that is uh, just a temporary. Yeah, it is temporary, but sometimes that temporary may be a slight opening of the window in their heart can be used by God in order to squeeze in the truth of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why we celebrate Christmas not because the Lord Jesus Christ was born on the 25th of December. But we celebrate Christmas because the Lord Jesus Christ was born. That's it. And we celebrate Christmas not only on the 25th of December, but I personally as a Christian, I celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ every day of my life. Because the fact remains the same. That he was born and that his birth is efficient and effective in saving people any day of the year, December 25th or otherwise. So that is how I look at it and that is how I believe it. Furthermore, I believe that there is also a scriptural precedent for commemorating and remembering the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 2 verses 10 to 12. This is uh, in our passage. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. What is good tidings? That is also good news, right? And good news is gospel. Yes, I know the gospel is uh, defined in the Bible as uh, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I believe that you're not going to disagree if I will tell you that the birth of Jesus Christ is good news. Amen. 
That's why the angel says, I, I uh, fear not. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. It is a day, day. It was a day of great joy, which shall be to all people, not only to, to, to the shepherds, but to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Verse 12. No more. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So I believe that the angels celebrated, the shepherds celebrated the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't see anything wrong if we will celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ without the paganistic things that are involved in the words celebration of Christmas. Because, uh, Brother Rison, do you celebrate your birthday? Are you sure? Uh, is it because an unbeliever celebrated this birthday in a sinful way that you are not going to celebrate your birthday anymore? You will forego the celebration of your birthday because, you see, they celebrated it with uh, drinking wine and uh, smoking pot. So we, we'll, will it cause you not to celebrate your birthday anymore because of what they did in celebrating their birthday? Of course not. So if the world is celebrating the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in a wrong way, let us celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in the right way. Amen? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Just don't uh, use Santa Claus. Just don't... Uh, you know, kiss every uh, people that you will see standing under the mistletoe. Uh, just don't do those things. We celebrate it by gathering together as a family, singing Christmas carols, uh, having a, uh, a, a good time, and bonding with our family. I don't think. And then reading the Christmas story, and then telling our children and our grandchildren the, first, the story of the first Christmas what is the significance of that? In all of these things, I believe there's nothing wrong if we're going to do those things. Number two, in Luke chapter 2, again, verses 13 and 14, the Bible says, And suddenly there was, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill, Toward men. Look at the response of the angels. With great joy. Because of the announcement. With, with, with great, and, uh, with, with great uh, joy and happiness. At the announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then let us look at the action of the shepherds in verses 15 to 20. And it, beca and, and it came to pass... As the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. What is wrong in celebrating something that will make us praise and glorify God in our lives? You see, not because people are doing it in the wrong way, then we should refrain from doing it in the right way. You know, if you're going to look at the history of Baptists, the, the Baptists before, they, they, they say amen, they shout amen, they shout hallelujah, they shout glory to God, but because uh, at the advent of the charismatic and Pentecostal churches, because they are uh, so loud in, in uh, shouting amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah, then most Baptists refrain from doing it. It is a sip. It's like the election in America. They were stolen from us. And now we don't celebrate them. We don't do them anymore. 
Because when we say, Hallelujah, they will think that we are Pentecostal or charismatic. When we say, Amen, when we say, Glory to God, when we say, Praise the Lord, then we think that people might judge us to be just like Pentecostals or charismatic. So we can see that there are precedent in the Bible about becoming joyful, glorifying God, worshiping God, honoring God during the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I have said, I believe there is nothing wrong to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ that will, in a manner that will glorify God. Actually, the, the truth is this. Is there a command for Christians to worship on Sunday in the Bible? I don't think so. But the early church did it in commemorating or in celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was nothing wrong about it. The truth is that during the early church, they met every day. Daily. From house to house. But why are we not doing it? Because it's not, it's not a command. It is a precedent in the Bible. And because they have done, uh, they met every first day of the week, then it became something that the church practiced in celebrating or commemorating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what is wrong if we celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though there was no command to do it? Same as what we call worshiping the Lord or gathering together and worshiping the Lord every Sunday or first day of the week. The command is clear. Not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. But there is no command that they have to meet on the first day of the week. And the, the, the first day of the week is not a Christian Sabbath. It did not replace the uh, uh, Sabbath of the Jews. It's not. It is a new thing that they did in celebrating or commemorating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they are looking at the significance of the resurrection. And it happened on the first day of the week. So they gather together on the first day of the week in order to celebrate and commemorate that. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So even though there is no specific command, they did it. So I don't think that there is something wrong if we are going to do it even though there is not a specific command for us to celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number four, they, op they are opposed to the celebration of Christmas because Christmas is a tradition filled with paganistic practices or even a paganistic origin. So this is uh, one of the, uh, I believe, one of the strongest argument of those who do not celebrate Christmas. Because they said that, you know, in the Christmas, uh, there is the tradition of using the, the Yule log, the Christmas tree, uh, meals, mistletoe, etc., etc., that are associated with Christmas. And therefore, because these things are associated, of course, Santa Claus, then we should not celebrate Christmas anymore because we need to abstain from all appearance of evil. Actually, they will even use uh, scripture in order to prove this, such as Jeremiah chapter 10. Of course, you just uh, read it at home, uh, verses 1 to 15. Isaiah chapter 40, 19 to 20, and Isaiah chapter 44, verses 14 to 17. If you're going to read all of this, it will point to a tree. It will point to people cutting that tree. It will point to people uh, like putting some ornaments on that tree. It will 
pertain to people worshiping the product of that tree or how they made that tree to be. So it is what we call associated with idolatry. So that is why they said that we should not celebrate Christmas because of the idolatrous practice that is involved or associated with it. But if you're going to look closely at the passages that I have given you and really study it, it has nothing to do with the Christmas tree. It has something to do with the idolatry. And as Christians, we do not worship idols. We do not worship uh, those that are made out of a tree or from a tree. We do not do that. So that is why this argument that they use against Christmas tree and other things that are associated with Christmas are not actually, will not actually hold water even as far as the Bible is concerned. So what are the considerations that we must look at and what are the issues that we are facing? Number one, let us consider this. The pagan associations were lost long, long time ago. They're already lost. But pastor, you mean to say because the, the pagan association is lost, then we can just use it? Well, actually we're doing it. Do you know what Monday is? What Sunday is? Sunday is a, a name used in celebrating the sun. And Monday is celebrating the moon. And Friday is celebrating Freya, the goddess of love. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday is of paganistic origin. But why do we use it? Because I do not think of Freya when I say Friday. I do not think of the sun, S-U-N, but I think of the sun, S-O-N, during Sunday. I do not think of uh, Saturn every Saturday. For me, it is uh, the name of the day of the week. And for me, it has nothing to do with the goddess that, they are, uh, that their names are taken from. So, the pagan association were actually lost long ago. We do not think of idolatry when we see a Christmas tree. We do not, we do not uh, think of, like for example, uh, another consideration is this. Let us understand that God created everything. And that the first people in this world are Adam and Eve. And God dealt with them. And God continues to deal with people. And God told people what is right. So the first truth or the things that this world have known are things from God. But because the devil came into the scene and distorted what God has taught the first people distorted the truth that God had given to the first people in this world and the early people of this world. Therefore, if you're going to trace everything back, the origin is with the truth. But as history goes, then this truth were distorted. Like, for example, one of the uh, most famous uh, Paganistic and cultic practice is what we call the mother and son worship. Like Horus and Isis. So, so many versions in almost every country. In Catholicism, Mary and Jesus. So, where do you think that truth came from? Was it an original truth given by the devil? Or maybe we can go back to Genesis chapter 3. And verse number 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So here, we can see that there is a mother who will 
have a son and that son will be the savior he will be the one to save us so even at that early stage there is already the truth of a mother and son but the devil distorted the truth by emphasizing the mother over the son or by worshiping mary than jesus so it is a truth from god distorted or corrupted by satan pass on through generation and now are we going to go away or do away with that because the word have distorted the truth no we know the truth and we will stick to the truth and we are going to worship god or celebrate this christmas season according to the truth not according to how the word is telling us to celebrate this season so maybe these paganistic practices are actually a distortion of the truth and if these paganistic practices are a distortion of the truth then as christians and as people of god and as people who have been set free by the truth therefore we can restore the truth in the celebration of all these things so i think that is also one consideration that we need to understand that we need to look at the tree not in an idolatrous way but to look at the tree that god used in order to crucify his son so that we can have eternal life so we can look at the uh, gifts under the tree as the gift that god has given us so you see when we know the truth then we do not do not have to be afraid of the distortions because we are not going to celebrate the distortions or we are not going to apply the distortions to the truth but we are going to remove all those distortions and paganistic things and just stick to what is right from the bible so pastor you mean to say that's also applicable to halloween no there is no precedent in the bible about halloween it is purely evil it is purely satanic there is there is not nothing in the bible that that uh, will will teach us about you know halloween or april fool's day of course there is one in the bible the the fool has set in his heart there is no god so a april 1st is what we call the national uh, international atheist day because they are fools and they do not believe in god so i think that is one consideration that we need to understand when we celebrate christmas in our time of course there are many other uh, arguments still but uh, we are out of time so lord willing we can continue this some other time or uh, we will also look at other things that are being a practice today by christians or even cults that uh, may affect how we look at the word of god so today we look at about christmas and then maybe some other day we're going to look about sabbath day of course we do not worship on sabbath but but we need to understand uh we need to understand the right application and the right doctrine from the word of god like for example when when the bible says for christ is the end of the law in romans chapter uh, i believe 10 verse number four what does it mean so let us just try to look at these things and understand so that whenever we do things like for example celebrating christmas because i, I even have some good friends who do not celebrate christmas uh, actually one of them is uh, you know him very well we are very close but we do not fight against it we do not argue about it we respect the position of each other regarding the celebration of christmas not even one time that i could remember in my life i have talked with him so many times in my life but we did not really discuss uh, these things because we we, we just uh, you know 
That's his position. I, res I respect it. It is my position. He respect my position. So, there is one principle in the Bible that I believe we need to uh, apply as we uh, end this study. Of course, this is not a uh, complete study, but let us look at Romans chapter 14. And then, if you have time, you read 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9. In verse number 5 of Romans 14, the Bible is clear. One man steameth a day above another, another steameth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So if you think that you should not celebrate Christmas, don't celebrate Christmas. If you think that you want to, say, to celebrate Christmas in, in, in what you believe the right way or you know the right way, then go ahead. But let us not judge one another. If they do not want to celebrate Christmas, let them not celebrate Christmas. If, if they celebrate Christmas and you do not celebrate Christmas, do not judge them. So I think that, that is uh, one good uh, principle that we can see. Look at verses 3, 4, and 13. Look at what the Bible says. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. For if we will substitute it, let not him that celebrate despise him that celebrate not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Like for example in the Philippines, there is a cult there who believe that we should not eat anything with blood. They are the Iglesia Ni Cristo. They said that if you eat anything with blood, then you are condemned to hell forever. And there are Christians who also do not eat blood, but they have their reason. Because for them, it is not healthy. Because they believe that most diseases and germs are in the blood. Like, like, like for example, if, if you are going to be tested if you are sick or not, they will take a blood sample. And they will look at the blood. So they do not eat blood for that purpose. Not because it was forbidden in the Old Testament. Not because they will go to hell if they will eat blood. They do not want to eat blood because for them, it is not medically healthy to do that. But in the case of others, they want to eat blood, especially with puto. Or the white, uh, what do you call that? Rice cake. That is the uh, perfect partner in the Philippines. Puto and dinuguan. So if they eat it, don't judge them. Do not despise them. Because in the Bible, if, if actually if the Bible is silent, there is liberty. We need to understand. If the Bible is clear, then we have to obey the Bible. If the Bible is silent, then there is liberty. If the Bible is clear that it forbids one thing, then we should not do it. If the Bible is clear that it commands us to do something applicable to us, then let us do it. But if the Bible is silent about something, then there is liberty. But don't use your liberty in order to uh, deprive others of their liberty. Look at Romans uh, chapter 14, verses 22 and 23. Question. Is it sinful to eat any kind of food that is offered to an idol? Is it sinful? Not good example. If somebody will see it. Because an example must be seen by somebody in order to be an example or to be a good or a bad example. But in essence, no, even if you offer all the food to the idols, it's not going to do anything with the food. It will not affect the food. Why? Because an idol is nothing. Okay? But there is a... a, a a uh, clear teaching in the Bible that if you will eat and your brother will stumble, don't eat. So that is the uh, principle of expediency. Paul says everything is lawful, but not all things are expedient. It will, if it will make your brother or sister stumble, don't do it for the sake of them. But 
Look at uh, uh, Romans 14, 23, 22 to 23. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubted is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So you see, even if you eat without faith, it is a sin. So you need to have faith. You thank God before you eat. Compare this to 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 8. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. So Paul uh, dealt with this. We know that an idol is nothing in the world. It's nothing. And that there is none other God but one. They're not even gods. There's only one God. They are nothing. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but unto us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all are all things, and we by him. How be it there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commended us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Nothing. But we consider other people. But we consider other Christians. Look at verse 1 of chapter 14 of Romans 1 and 2. Or, or verse 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things. These are Baptists. Another who is weak eateth herbs. These are saved Seventh-day Adventists, of course. <laughs> You can be safe in, in any religion as long as you know the truth. But, but, Baptist, but, but there are those people or Christians who believe that they can eat all things. And then there are those who believe that they can only eat herbs. Verse number three. This is the point. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth for God hath received him. So the ultimate issue is our attitude. The reason and how if one decides to celebrate the Christmas season in some fashion. That's why we study, we talk to each other, we help each other, so that we can celebrate things in a way that will glorify God and if we do those things in a way that will glorify God and will not be against any teaching, doctrine, or principle of the Word of God, then I don't think something is wrong with that. The Word celebrates Christmas with Santa Claus, Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, the North Pole, Frosty, the snowman. Actually, there is, a pro uh, there is now a health protocol in America that you can only make two. Uh, frosty snowmen and you, they should have mask in order to avoid or prevent the spread of coronavirus. Secular songs about Christmas, booze, parties, pots and all, sexual uh, activities, all of these things, rock music, that's the, word way, that's the way of the world. But the way of the Christian should be Jesus Christ singing carols that, that will make us remember about what the Lord Jesus Christ did, soul winning, and giving gift to the poor that will help them see and understand the love of God. And I believe that we're going to do these things. I don't think it is wrong for us to celebrate Christmas. Do you remember the last Christmas that we did? I think not last year, the other year, when we ga gather uh, uh, gifts like food and clothes and other things, and we went to the poorest area of, uh, of, of this community and we went to their place and we gave them this gift and told them that because God loves you and it opened some good relationship 
with other people. So I believe people are going to do it that way. Then we are not committing sin when we celebrate Christmas. Amen? Let, what's important is that we know the reason why we celebrate the season. It is not because of how the world celebrates it or how the world celebrates Christmas, but it is we celebrate Christmas because one day a Savior was born. And it surely made us glad and joyful and happy and praise God in our lives. Amen? So I hope and I pray that as we celebrate Christmas, then let's do it this way. And if you have some friends who do not celebrate Christmas, please do not judge them. Do not look down at them. Let us try to use the season in order to strengthen one another and develop more friendship than continually be divided because we cannot meet eye to eye on certain issues. Before I close, last night there was this... Uh, I was invited to watch a Zoom presentation regarding sinner's prayer. Because there is this group that oppose sinner's prayer. They said that it is demonic. That once you believe or teach sinner's prayer, then you are teaching the doctrine of the devil. So now the Baptists in the Philippines are now again be, being divided because of this. So they are throwing hurtful words against each other. They said that you are, you are from the devil because you do not want people to get saved. And then all of these things. So there was this invitation that says that we are going to give a presentation regarding the sinner's prayer versus parot prayer. So now they coined another term, parot. That is the repeat after me prayer. But what happened last night is that the evangelist lambasted the people who believes in sinner's prayer. You see, I told them we should not fight and we should not be divided. Because I asked both sides. Can you tell me how a person will be saved? He explained to me that it is by grace through faith. Not of works, not of anything else, but by grace through faith. And then I asked those that believe in sinner's prayer. They said the same thing. So I asked this person, so why do you condemn them when they ask the sinner to pray? Because they are leading the people uh, to believe that because they prayed, they are saved. So I said, is that salvation? No, it's not. Are you teaching that? They said, no, we're not teaching that. We are leading them in the sinner's prayer because of, you see, we are, most of us are Filipinos. I do not go with the Americans. But most Filipinos are shy when it comes to religious matters. Even if they want Example, if they want to pray or to profess, they would rather not do it if nobody will do it. But if somebody will start doing it, then they will uh, show what is inside of them. At least most, not all Filipinos are like that. So that is why most soul winners in the Philippines will lead a person to a prayer and they call that sinner's prayer but if we uh, but i told them if we are going to analyze there is a common ground and this is the most important ground that both believe that salvation is based on the finished work of the lord jesus christ now the question is this did that person got saved after he prayed or before he prayed and again if you ask them clearly even those who believe in sinner's prayer will tell you, oh, they got saved even before they prayed. Because their prayer is only the manifestation of their inner faith. So I said, if you're just going to look at it, you are actually 
teaching the same thing. But because you concentrated on the terms. Sinner's prayer. And this one. Uh, faith plus nothing, minus nothing. Then you concentrated on the terminologies and you forgot your common ground. And sometimes it's like that also. With those who believe in celebrating Christmas and with those Christians who do not believe in celebrating Christmas. If we will just look at the common ground, we will see that we are both in the truth. Teaching the truth, believing the same truth. But it got lost because of the angle or the area that we are concentrating on. If you put your mind into something and, I, and you said that I am dogmatic, I don't believe this, then you're going to look at everything in the light of that mindset. But if you will just look at the common ground, then we will avoid so many arguments. Because the common ground is the only ground wherein we can see I. So I shall we stand up?